There is no one like you, Jesus. We just thank you for these songs, these words that you've given to us. We just love to praise you, Lord. We love to let you know how much you mean to us. So we just ask that you accept this worship that we've just given to you. And now we ask that you allow us to slow down, allow us to concentrate. You've given words to Randy that you need us to hear. And we ask that you allow us to free our minds so that we can do that. We have been put on this earth, Lord, so that we can give glory to you, that we can give praises to you, that we can be glorious in your name. So we just ask that the message you've provided this week, Lord, however you need that to touch each of us, that we allow it to do that. We love you, Lord. We give all of this to you. Amen. Wasn't that interesting? I just thought that was really, really an intriguing video. Uh, a couple months ago, I went with the young adult interns to New York City to be part of the program Metro World Child. We were there last year, too, or two years ago. I lose track of time. But it's a program where they do uh, sidewalk Sunday school in 220 neighborhoods throughout the city of New York, in all the different boroughs. It's very, very interesting. And uh, share Jesus' love, engage with not just the children, but also their families in many cases, touch the lives of as many as 20,000 people in a week. And they had us running from morning till night, the whole week long. Very good. We get back, and after we get back from our experience, um, I, I was interacting with one of the young adults because we mentor them. And I was talking to this one individual and saying, so, what did you think about the week? Did you, did you like it? What did it mean to you? And he said, I really liked it, but one criticism I would have is we didn't have enough time to really reflect, to really think about it. And I said to him, well, how is that different from your normal life? He said, you're right. That's the way my life is. I'm too busy. We, we start our consistory meetings, leadership body of the church, we start our consistory meetings uh, every month with the same question. How are you doing really? We go around the table. How are you doing really? Not just how are you doing in a superficial sense. Like, how are you really doing? And one month, just a couple months ago, we went around the table. How are you doing really? Everybody had the same answer. Everybody said, essentially, we're overwhelmingly busy. Anybody here feel busy? Anybody here feel busy? Everybody felt busy. Felt really busy. Have you ever said or thought or heard someone say, I'm too busy to even think about it. You know, I, can't, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even have time to think. Anybody ever feel that way? I don't even have a time to think. It's, it's just ridiculous how occupied I am. I don't, I don't have time to think. Whose fault is that? If that's a true statement, whose fault is it that you're so busy you don't have time to think? Whose fault is that? That's ours. So earlier in the uh, internship program, we made the, we requested, uh, demanded, required as best we could, pleaded with the young adults to read a book. The book was called Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, and Jim Regal loves this book, and it's just a good leadership book, and there's a variety of things in there that have impacted me, made me think, and um, one of them was a, a chart that makes you think about time, how you use your time. And there's, there's four quadrants. And the top here, if you can't read it, this, this column is urgent. Urgent. This, okay, who's called? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. But Because every time I said the word urgent, you coughed. We had that coordinated down. That was beautiful. Anyway, this column is urgent. This column is not urgent. This column is important. This is not important. Four quadrants, okay? Think about your life. How much of your time is spent 
doing urgent and important things, this quadrant. You gotta do it now, and it's really, really, really important. You ever feel like that? The author of the book, Stephen Covey, says, often that's where we spend our lives. We just run from one thing to another, to another, to another. You ever feel like that? That's what you are? Just running from one fire to another, one challenge to another, that's where we live. Urgent, important. This quadrant is important, but not urgent. It's an important thing to do, but it's not pressing. Nobody's demanding it. It doesn't have to be done, but it's important. This quadrant is not important, but urgent. How many of you do those kinds of things? Not important, Amy's saying, yes, absolutely. Not important, but urgent. That, when I think about that for myself, it's like people coming up to me saying, you've got to do this for me. And I say, but I don't care about that. That's not important to me. But because I'm a people-pleasing kind of personality type, I do it anyway. And I find myself doing something that I don't regard as important. It might be important to you, but I don't regard it as important, but it is urgent. Because now I got to do it and I got a deadline hanging over my head. You ever do anything not important but urgent? And then this quadrant, not important, not urgent. Not important, not urgent. And, and you think, well, that's dumb. Why would anybody do that? Uh, you know what goes in that box? Solitaire goes in that box. <laughs> right? That's what goes there. Solitaire goes there. Not important, not urgent. And how many of us play solitaire? Why do we play solitaire? I'll tell you why I play solitaire. Uh, we, the author of the book suggests that we do important things and urgent things and we go, 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 go. And then we fry our brain eventually and then we go over here. <laughs> it's a, I need to unwind. And we go over there. Now, of these four boxes, of these four quadrants, which do you think would be the wisest to spend some time in? The author says the most wise book to commit, quadrant to commit to is this one here, the second quadrant. Important, not urgent. Let me explain. How many of you think that it's important, very important to exercise? Anybody here think it's important to exercise? See, that's part of the problem. We have six hands up. <laughs> okay. But that's only because you knew there was a punchline to the question. But how many of us actually think it's important to exercise? We all know it's important to exercise, right? Is it urgent? It's not urgent at all. Is it important that you go for a run or you exercise or you do something? Yes, but I don't have to do that. And so I probably won't. It's important, not urgent. How many of you think it's really important to read your Bible every day? You're in church. Come on. Come on. Hands up. Hands up. We, think it's, we all think it's important. Is it urgent? It's not urgent. How many of you think you're married? How many of you think it's really important to invest in your married relationship? Anybody think that? If you don't raise your hand and your spouse is here, you just had a problem. Okay, that was a problem. That's very, very important. It's important. Is it urgent? No, not urgent. My point is that there are some things in life, many things in life that are important but they're not urgent. Because they're not urgent, we tend to spend our time parked over here and we don't get around to doing it. The author of the book has a chart, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He has a chart in there that says, here, map out your week's activities and block in some time for important, not urgent things so you make sure you get around to doing those important, not urgent things. Okay? And, and, and that makes a lot of sense to me doing important, not urgent things. So let me introduce the first scripture just as an introduction to what I want to talk about today. Probably most of us remember the story of the time when Jesus, 12 years old, went to the temple for Passover with his family. And, and he was there. It was a great experience. Time to go home. Mom leaves thinking that Jesus is with the father. The father leaves thinking Jesus is with the mother. And what's the net effect? Jesus is left at the temple. Every now and then, that'll happen here in our church. Mother will leave. They've driven separately. Mother will leave. The kid stays here. The father will leave. Kid stays here. We talk to the kid. The kid says, yeah, mom, daddy. We call the parents up and they say, no, we'll just leave him there for a week. That's what happens sometimes. But... Uh, that's what happened in Jesus' case. Jesus is left in the synagogue. Listen, that's where I want to pick up the story. It says, three days later, they finally discovered Jesus in the temple, 
sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his teaching, at his understanding and his answers. Now, typically, when I've thought about that scripture, I think Jesus must have really wowed them with his knowledge. That's where we can go in our minds. He really wowed them with his knowledge. These religious leaders were really wowed by his knowledge. But the thing that jumped out at me was not his answer to the quest, answers, but rather his questions. It says he was sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. I really appreciate good questions, don't you? What, what do good questions do for you? Good questions make me think. If, if, a good, if, if somebody asks us a really, really, really good question, it can, you go home, you mow the lawn, you, what do you do when you're, I have a riding mower, we took his land. When I'm riding my lawn, my, riding my lawn, uh, uh, you know what I do with that question? I think about it. I think about it. Really good question. One time years ago, Deanna and I went with our young children to, on our vacation, we went to Plymouth Plantation. Anybody ever go to Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts? That's a really nice place. Pilgrims landed, you can see the Mayflower package deal, whatever. And, and it's just a restored village, like every other restored village, except in one respect, at least when we went. I don't know what it's like now. But if you go to Williamsburg, <coughs> if you go to Williamsburg, you go and the interpreters will be in this building or that building and they'll, they'll give their narrative. You come in, they give you the answers, they tell you the story, not in, not in Plymouth Plantation. You have Miles Standish walking around doing his thing. And people will be doing their thing. They'll be living life. And if you want to get any value out of it, you got to ask them questions. They gave us a folder that describes a little background information. So it's a launching pad for asking questions. And I remember when I was there, I said something that I really believe. I said something to my kids. I said, hey, kids, one of the signs of intelligence is the ability to ask good questions. Ask questions here. you got to ask questions. That's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was in this passage of scripture, asking questions. Here's what I decided to do this summer. I decided that I'm gonna preach throughout the entire summer on questions Jesus asked in the scripture. Uh, reason being that our attendance patterns are erratic in the summertime. You're here this week, not here next week. And, and they then, just focusing on a singular question every week, it's like a standalone. You don't have to be here the previous week to get the, you know, you, you can fit it and figure it out. And, and so I want to ask, uh, I want to focus on this question. Did you know that Jesus asked as many as 207 questions that are recorded in the scriptures? 207 questions. Three, excuse me, 307 questions. Why? Why do you think Jesus asked 307 questions? Do you think it's because Jesus didn't know the answers? But Jesus knew the answers to the questions. So why did he ask the questions? What do you think the purpose was behind Jesus asking the questions? To get us to think. And, and what I want to do this summer, beginning with today, is to look at some questions that Jesus asked, but pull the question out of the Bible and get us to actually think about that question for ourselves. I don't want to just talk about the question in the context of scripture and say, this was a question, this is how it was resolved in scripture. I'd like to pull the question out and, and let you actually address the question that Jesus was asking in the scripture, but you take it personally. A answer the question, answer the question for yourself. That's what I'm suggesting, that you actually answer the question for yourself. So here's the story, here's the story I want to look at uh, this morning. Listen, Jesus had, uh, Jesus had just healed somebody. And after having healed somebody, it says this, uh, Matthew 9, 27. After Jesus left the girl's home, so the girl was healed. He left the girl's home. Two blind men, that's why we showed the video clip. Is she, is she okay? Is she okay? Anybody have cough drop or anything? She's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Well, we love you. Um, and hope you feel better. Yeah. Well, let's pray for her. I'm going to pray. I forget your name. Cindy. Cindy. Lord Jesus, Cindy's coughing and uh, not feeling really well. I just pray that you'd minister to her. Maybe she'll sit in the other room or whatever, but just help her to not feel so caught up, congested. Maybe she's asthma. 
just uh, bring healing to her right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. So anyway, Jesus just had healed somebody, left the girl's house, two blind men, that's why we showed the video, get the, get the sense of what it would be like in that time frame to be a blind guy. They, these two blind men followed along behind Jesus shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. And they went right into the house where he was staying and Jesus asked them, here's the question for the day, do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. And then he touched their eyes and said, because of your faith, it will happen. When their eyes were open, then their eyes were open and they could see. Jesus sternly warned them, don't tell anyone about this. And of course, they went out and they told everybody about it anyway. So the question was, what? Jesus saying to you, we want to take it out of scripture now and ask you, do you believe that Jesus can make you see? Jimmy, do you believe Jesus can make you see? Now, what's the problem for Jimmy? He can see. The question doesn't relate to him. Let's all talk about Jimmy for a moment. He won't know it. Do you think there's any area of Jimmy's life in which he's blind? Think there's any blind areas of Jimmy's life? Yeah, there is. Does he know what they are? Let me ask you this question. How does a blind person know they're blind? How do you figure that out? Like, how do you figure out that you're blind if you're blind? I'm, I have an appendix, or had one. How did I know I needed it? How did I know I had one? How do you know? I, what's this for? I don't know. It's gone. I don't, know. I don't miss it. I don't miss my appendix. Is it here? I don't know. It's gone. I don't know where it is. But I mean, a blind person could be walking around saying, I wonder what these lumps are for in my head. They don't know what these eyes are for. And how do you go about expressing to a blind person what blindness is? How do you explain that? Hey, you're blind. All you have is uh, feel, smell, touch, auditory ability. And you say, I don't mean to offend you, but you're missing something. What am I missing? You're, you're missing the ability to see. What's that? Well, there's images that come to your, through your eyes. Well, what's an image? Oh, an image is, I mean, how do you express that to a person? Same thing with Jimmy. How does Jimmy know that he's blind? He is blind. I believe he's blind. Theoretically, I believe he's blind about something in his life. How, do, how does he know that he's blind? And... and and if he doesn't know that he's blind, how would he address the question Jesus asked, do you want to be able to see? Do you believe I can make you see? It's, it's, it's hard to even think about. But let's just leave it there for a moment. I'll come back to that. Here's a question about these blind guys in the story. Did they want to be able to see? Did they want to be able to see? Yeah. How desperately do you think they wanted to be able to see? Very much so. Let's just listen to it again. Listen to it again. Uh, two blind guys followed along behind Jesus. Now think about that for a moment. Two follow, they followed along. What do you think it's like for, to be a blind guy following along behind Jesus on a rough, uneven road surface? What's that like to be blind and follow along? Now it's one thing if somebody's holding your hand and guiding you or if you have one of those white sticks, but Jesus is hustling along. Jesus is moving from point A to point B and these blind guys, they're coming along. Do you think they may have fallen at any point? As they following Jesus, I think they could have easily. And it's not a, it's not a smooth surface. They, they gashed their leg. Did they, did they say, oh, shucks, I gashed my leg. It's bleeding. Now what do I do? And they stop and they stay. They, I don't think they stop. This is their one shot to have an interchange with Jesus. And they're not letting a, a stumble and an injury keep them from following Jesus. Right now, I want to be, they're continuing. It says, he left the girl's house. Two blind guys followed them along, followed along behind him shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, how many of you like to be the center of attention? Anybody here like to be the center of attention? Say, I like to be the center of attention. I don't mind shouting. I, I sometimes shout. There's a story about me shouting in a public setting that I can't tell until Deanna dies. I can't wait for her to die sometime because it's a very good story. But I've got to wait. Something to look forward to. She wants, and she continues to tell me, it's, it was her idea, not mine originally, to throw water balloons in my 
grave. It was her idea. So I correct that. But I can't wait for her to die because I get to tell a story. So that's the way it is be between us in our marriage. But anyway, it says here that they're shouting. Many of us are shy and reserved, right? I wouldn't mind, in certain, if I'm in the right mood, especially out of state, I don't mind shouting and making a fool of myself at all. But here these guys are, and they're shouting. What would motivate these guys? One of the two was more shy than the other. What causes them to shout? They're desperate. They're blind. They know they're blind. They can't quite identify what blindness means, but they know that something's lacking in their life that they desperately want. And they're shouting. They don't care what anyone thinks because this is my one shot. Oops, I fell. I hurt myself. Now nah, it's bleeding. Blood is running down my leg, but I don't care. This is my shot at being able to see. Let me read on. It says, they're shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. Then they went, did you catch this before? They went right into the house where Jesus was staying. Did they knock? Apparently not. Were they invited in? They didn't care. Why? Because they were desperate to be able to see and no one was stopping them. They were desperate. They wanted to be able to see. Jimmy, you're blind. You want to be able to see? Does he strike you as desperate? Not particularly. Here's the problem with Jimmy. I drove one person out of church, and I'll drive another person out of church. Here's, here's the problem. You got to forgive me. If I tease you, I just I, I have no self control. And Deanna tells me it's getting worse as I'm getting older. It's just getting worse. That's why attendance is just going to plummet. It's just ridiculous. Jimmy doesn't know what he's missing. That's the problem with Jimmy. He's blind and he doesn't know what he's missing. Something's missing and he doesn't know it. It's a problem with all of us. We're all blind in some way. You see what I'm saying? So that's, I'm finished with that blind story. I want to talk about another blind story. This is all kinds of blind stories in the Bible. So I want to talk about another, two more guys that are blind. Okay? This story is told in the Gospel of Luke. These two guys, we, we encounter these two blind guys on Easter Sunday of all days. Okay, so Easter Sunday's happened. The women get up early, go to the tomb. They're going to anoint the body of Jesus. They come in, and, and the body's gone, and they encounter an angel. They say, oh, no, Jesus is alive. And they, they run off. They tell the disciples, he's, he's alive, he's alive. And the guys go, what are the names of the two guys that run to the grave? You've been, you've been in church on Easter, right? What are the two guys that run to the grave fast? Peter and John, they run, one of them gets there first, forget which one's faster runner, the other guy had an excuse as to why he was in second place, but they get there, they check it, they look, and, and he is, he's gone, there's a little bit of confusion there for them, and they run back, they tell the others, hey, Jesus is gone, and, and, they're, and they're like, he's, he's not here, and, and, and word is out in the entire community that something's going down with Jesus. And among all the people talking about and expressing confusion over the fact that Jesus is not where he belongs is, is these two guys, two blind guys. They're not really blind. They're blind like Jimmy's blind. And they're walking down the road to their house in, Emma, in Emmaus, which is seven miles away. How, does, how long does it ta take for, for the average person to walk seven miles? Two hours and 20 minutes, 20 minute mile. Okay, so they're walking for two hours and 20 minutes and and guess who starts walking alongside of them? We all know this story. Who's walking with them? And they don't recognize him, right? He's walking with them, but they don't recognize him. What's another word for Jesus is walking next to you and you don't recognize him? What's another way of saying the same thing? They are what? They are blind. Here Jesus is, and they're blind. They don't see him. Isn't that crazy? So they're walking and talking, and they're expressing their grief over what's happened. At one point, we get a window into how they're really feeling. There's this one line, 17th verse of Luke 24, that says, sadness was written across their faces. They're really bummed out there. How did the guys that were physically blind feel about their blindness? They were messed up. They weren't happy about their blindness. These guys weren't happy either. They just didn't know they were blind. All they knew was that they weren't happy. Sadness was written across their faces. Sadness was written across their faces. And the funniest thing is they're walking with Jesus and they don't know it's Jesus. And Jesus is trying to explain. He's trying to explain to them that this is all prophesied in the scripture. It's it was predicted that he would die and come back to life. And he, he, he 
tells them all about the Messiah and all the scripture. And guess what? It went in one ear and out the other. They didn't get it because they were what? They were... They didn't get it. And you know, sometimes you can talk to somebody until you're blue in the face and, and speak from the vantage point of God and they don't get it. They're blind. Jesus said, the interesting line one time, Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. It's just another way of saying some people don't have ears. Some people are blind. And so these guys are blind. They don't see Jesus and they're walking. And Jesus explaining to them, and, and sometimes you can't get through the people. Jesus wasn't able to verbally get through to these people. They were that blind. Blindness is blindness. And when you're blind, you don't know you're blind. They didn't know they were blind. They just were blind. And Jesus is trying to get through to them, talking, getting through to them. And he's not getting through to them. And finally, they, 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 two hours and 20 minutes have passed. They come to one of their houses and they say, hey, hey, this has been interesting. Jesus is about to go on. They say, come on in, have, have something to eat. He comes into the house and, and, and they're sitting down. They're getting food out on the table and they, they, they hand him the bread and say, hey, why don't you break this loaf of bread up and spread it around. And Jesus breaks the bread and it says, suddenly... Their eyes were open and they recognized him. All of a sudden, they were able to see. They got it. Do you get it? They got it. They could see. Which, question, which of the two sets of blind men were happier? The guys who had been blind maybe from birth physically? When they were able to see, what do you think they, what did they do? What did they do? I told you that Jesus said, don't do this, and they did it anyway. What did they do? They ran around and told everybody. And so what happens in this story? If you know this story, what happens when the two guys are able to say, whoa, we saw Jesus. What do they do next? Next, Very next thing. Any of you remember? They run right back to Jerusalem. They just went the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they turn right back around and run back to tell the people why. Because they are excited about the fact that they were blind, and now they can see Jesus is alive. Who's happier? The blind guys that now can physically see or the blind guys that now can spiritually see? Who's happier? They're both happy. They're both happy. They're both happy. So here's, what's the question of the day? Here's the question of the day. Let me, let me find it in the Bible here. Yeah, there it is. Jesus says to you, think it, it's Jesus to you. Here's the question. Roxanne. Jesus, oh, she, she looked up. Roxanne, do you believe that Jesus can make you see? Yeah, yeah, see. That, and, but the question then is, there's a corollary to that question. How am I, how am I blind? Okay, I'm going to continue to speak now. Did you figure it out yet? See, that's the problem with the sermons. There's, there's, what, what did I talk about over here? Some things are important, but not urgent. Figuring out how you're blind and whether you believe that Jesus can or cannot he enable you to see is, is important. Don't you think that's important? Do you think that's an important question? Do you think it's urgent? No. So here's what's going to happen. Here's, this is a lousy sermon. Here's why. Because if it was a good sermon, I'd do it well and correctly. Here's what I should do right now in the sermon. I should say... This is a very important question, not urgent, but important. I'm controlling your use of time right now, so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to stop the worship service right now, and I want you to take a walk. I, or do whatever you do, but my thing is taking a walk, and I want you to spread out. Get outside this building. It's a nice day, a little warm, but it's a nice day. Go walk in the cemetery, walk over in the property of the church, walk, sit down underneath the tree, but get out of this building... And get by yourself. Don't go with anybody else. Get away. And leave your cell phones here. And don't take any paper along with you. No distractions. I don't want you writing your grocery list right now. Because everything interferes with our thoughts. When I was, when I was at this, sermon, this point in the sermon in the first service, guess what happened? Guess what happened? Somebody's cell phone went off. Isn't that typical? Here I am, finally ready to deal with an important, not urgent question. And what happens? 
the cell phone goes off. Does that ever happen to you? You're dealing with something important, not urgent, and the cell phone goes off. And it distracts you. Leave your stinking phones here, take a half hour walk, and deal with these two questions. The main question and then the corollary question. One, do you want Jesus, do you believe Jesus can help you see? And two, how am I blind? Now take a break and go out and walk and think about that one. But here's the reality of, of what I'm dealing with. I got another service coming in in a couple of minutes, and they're going to be giving me dirty looks because we ran over again. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move on, and here's what you'll do. If you follow the pattern of every other week, you'll shake my hand at the door, you'll say, that was a nice sermon today, and you go on, your cell phone will ring, and you'll forget everything about it. And I'm arguing this morning that this is, if it's a question that Jesus, I'm not elevating the importance of the sermon, I'm just arguing the fact that if this is a question that Jesus asked, because it's Jesus asking the question, and because he's asking the question not to find out an answer, but to make us think, then I think it's important, not urgent, and, and we'd be wise to attend to his question. So I'm suggesting that during the course of the summer, you think about the questions I'm raising, get a podcast or DVD or whatever it is, and, and hear the question and think about the question. Spend some time and actually talk to God about the question that Jesus asked. How am I blind, God? Ask him that. And shut up for a moment. Sorry, Deanna, I know that's a bad word. I know you told me that this week. That's a bad word, and I can't say it. I apologize. I was wrong. I have sinned. Sorry. Keep your big, fat mouth shut and listen to God, okay? Just listen to God, answer the question, how am I blind? Listen to that. And, and, and then pray. And say to God, I believe you can, can help me see in this area of my life. That's your assignment. That's your assignment. Now, let me give you a couple examples just to help you think about what you might encounter if you were on your walk. Because it's so hard to explain to a blind person what it is to see. And it's hard to explain to Jimmy how he's blind. Because he's blind. Not to be offensive, but there's someone here in this room that's blind about what it means to have a personal, living, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't get it. You come to church week after week after week, you do the ritual, and you think you're behaving in, a, in, in the appropriate way. And I'm not condemning the way you're behaving. That's not the, that, that's not the point. You just don't get it. And at some point, there's a variety of reasons why you might be blind. Maybe for some of us in the room, we might have questions for God. And it's almost this position of when you can answer satisfactorily my questions, God, then I will give my life to you. And, and in a sense, you're keeping God at bay. And I'm if that's you, my fear is, that you don't actually have a relationship with God because your, your questions are keeping you from having that and you don't even know what you're missing. There's this old hymn that sometimes people want me to read at funerals. Old hymn, in the garden it's called. It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still in the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and I walk with him I talk with him, and he tells me I am his own. And the voice I hear falling on, no another has ever known. And it's like this description of a relationship with God that's real. And you're saying, what are you talking about, Randy? If you said, what are you talking about, Randy? You don't get it. And you don't get it because you're blind. And I'm saying that, like, you're blind, people. You're blind, you're blind, individual. You don't have it. And I want you to have it because just like it's so great to be able to physically see, you just are missing a deep and rich and wonderful relationship with the living God and the thing that's blocking it is, but I have to have my questions answered. You're missing the point. I know the questions are important, but you're missing the point. Or maybe 
You don't have a relationship with God because you're ticked off at him because of something rotten that happened in your past. And I'm not downplaying the rottenness or the cruelty of whatever transpired in your life, but your anger is keeping you from having a relationship with God. And when I say relationship with God, you don't even know what I'm talking about. And you're blind. I'd like you to take a walk and say, God, how am I blind? And he might reveal to you, you don't actually have a relationship with God. Why don't you pray and invite Christ into your life and open the door? Romans, uh, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens the door, I will come in and, and eat with him and he with me and have a relationship with him. Why don't you do that today when you take your walk in the cemetery or wherever you take your walk? And when you do that, you won't be able to explain what just happened, but all of a sudden your eyes will be open and you'll say, It's real. And I desperately want it to be real for you. And I don't know how to express what it is because you're blind. I'm doing my best to explain your condition of blindness to you. And I, I can't do any better than I, I'm limited by human language. Just like I'm trying to explain to a blind person what it is to be physically blind. Maybe you're blind in a different way. I, I work in my sermons weeks in advance. I went to the Creation Festival this week. I'm not a big fan of music. And uh, said so to my friend, I, I go, I love to be with the people. Uh, Jason never understands when I say this, but I, I, music is poetry. I don't like poetry. Music, I can never understand the words. So it just, it, I'm just a weird person that way. I'm just a weird person. But I've gone to creation for a billion years. And I told my friend, Howie Irwin, who I see every year, he went to college with me. I said, Howie, once I'm no longer paid to go to this festival, I'm not coming anymore. So... Anyway, I saw Howie this week, but there's a lot of aspects that are wonderful. I saw somebody on Facebook say that just she connected with God in a deep, 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 deep way that she hadn't had before. I love creation. I love what it does for people. Come next year with us because the fellowship is terrific. And the showers are exhilaratingly cold. And it's, there's so many good things about it. Okay, so I'll see you there. If you come, I said to one kid, the reason I came this year, I, came, I said to a kid, I'll go if you go. She said, I'll go. I went. So if you say to me, if you didn't go to creation before and you say, I'll go if you go, I'll go again next year. Okay, how's that for a deal? So anyway, this year I was at creation and when the music, the big bands that you would love to hear that I'm like, oh, whatever, I was taking a walk. And, and as I took a walk, I, I was really thinking about a sermon series for September, September 17th. That's the one I was working on. And I encountered a scripture. And, and the scripture is Ephesians 2.10. I'm going to talk about this on September 17th. It says this. Interesting scripture. It says, hold it, where is it? There it is. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Okay, so Bob, do you think of yourself as a masterpiece of God? Do you think of yourself as a masterpiece? Answer the truth, Bob. <laughs> Not perfect. Not perfect. You, you, come on, honestly, you don't think of yourself as a masterpiece. There's no way. I mean, I can tell you how you're not a masterpiece, but that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, far from it, far from it. But it says here, it, 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 all joking aside, it says, it says that Bob Crawford is a masterpiece created by God. Now wrap your mind around that. See, Bob doesn't believe that, just like nobody in the room believes that. You know why he doesn't believe that? Because he's what? blind. Bob is blind to that. Bob doesn't see that. Do you hear what else it says about Bob? It says that Bob is God's masterpiece, that God created Bob anew when he came to Christ Jesus, and he has, so that Bob could do good things that God planned for Bob. God, this, your name is problematic for me. <laughs> God created Bob anew so that Bob could do the good things that God planned for Bob to do a long time ago. Like there's things, Bob, that you're not doing that God created you to do. And you don't have a clue what that means. And that's because you're blind. You see what I'm saying here? It's blind. Does that bother you? It should bother you. So here's what he ought to do after the service. He had to take a walk or go for a run. Bob likes running. Can you run and think at the same time? As all I think about is the throbbing in my head when I run. 
But if you run and can think, you ought to go for a run today, Bob. And you ought to think about, God, in what way am I blind? Because I believe that you can help me see. And I want to see. That's what you should do, Bob. That's what everybody should do. Because you are God's masterpiece. So I'm going down a couple of paths. How are you blind? And that may be one way in which Bob is blind. Maybe there's somebody here that's never, never entered into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And you don't even know what that means. And I'm saying you've got to pray a prayer and seek that out and you'll experience it. It's called the miracle of new birth. One more example, then I'll wrap it up. Final example, there's dozens more I could give, is there could be an area of sin in your life that you're blind to. You just don't get it. You've, you've downplayed the significance of this particular sin. You've, you've underestimated its significance. You just, it's just, it's, I don't even see that it's a problem. It's a problem. You're blind to it. It's going to do some serious damage if you don't deal with it. Take it. There's the cell phone. I was waiting for that. Whose cell phone? Let me take it. Pull. I like that. Just pull. Anyway. It's a nice tune, too. Nice tune. Sin. Here's a sin. Here's a sin. It's a sin to bring a cell phone into church without muting it. That's a sin. And you don't know that until you take seriously. There may be something going on in your life. You've got to look at it. Take that walk and say, God, how am I blind? What am I blind to? I'm just saying, ask the question, address the question that Jesus asked. Don't just let it be a question for these two blind guys in the scripture in Luke or Matthew 9. Let it be your question. Jesus, I believe you can heal my blindness. Have at it. I'm telling you, there's a bunch of blind people here that don't realize they're blind. So take some time and reflect on that. And the larger issue that I'm going to deal with all summer long is, is questions Jesus asked. And every one of the questions Jesus asked is important, but not urgent. Important, not urgent. Let me pray. Lord God, I, I pray that you would help us to spend some time with you and give you the undivided attention that, that you absolutely deserve and that we would be wise to allocate for you. Help us to, to just think about this question that Jesus asked. How am I blind? And make a declaration. I believe you can set me free. I believe you can heal me. I believe you can help me see. Lord Jesus... I pray for that for every single person in the room. Youngest, oldest, if, if, if there's a young child getting the message of what I've been trying to say, I pray that this would take root in their heart, in their life. Please help them. Help us all to be able to see. In your name we pray. Amen. Father God, we're calling you, Lord Jesus. We all are blind in different areas of our life. And this busyness in life, Lord, I just, man, it, it's something that weighs on my heart, as I'm sure it does on everybody's. It's just going to bring us down one of these days, and we're going to fall hard. Help us, Father, to take time to truly get into your word and to seek the areas in our lives where we're blind so that you can bring healing to us. Restore us. Help us to truly live for you. Bring change in us. Fill us with your peace that we don't understand. The joy that we don't understand. We're missing it. At times we're not, but at times we are. So refresh us, Father, this week as we search. Give us the motivation to take the time to search, to look deep within us, and to allow your incredible, amazing power to make changes, to open our eyes. We love you, Lord, and we just praise you, and we give you all the thanks, all the glory. 
it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Keep searching.